Hello and welcome to our weekly look at events inside Syria. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The Friends of Syria group of nations met in Tunis on Friday. Leaders from more than 70 countries discussed ways to stop the violence in Syria. Their focus remains a political solution. There is a push for a civilian peacekeeping mission once the violence stops, but military intervention is an option that for the moment remains off the table. Saudi Arabia and Qatar say they want to provide weapons to the opposition, but other countries supported a more peaceful resolution to the crisis. The meeting failed to agree on any concrete course of action to end the violence. Well, at a time when events on the ground look more set to determine Syria's future than diplomatic manoeuvres beyond its border, let's take a look at what was achieved in Tunis. The main Syrian opposition group, the Syrian National Council, is now seen as a legitimate representative of the Syrian people seeking peaceful democratic change. Nations will work with the opposition to prepare for a post-Assad Syria, including lucrative commercial deals. They also discussed the reinforcement of economic and diplomatic sanctions. They decided on steps that nations should take to tighten the noose on the regime, including boycotting Syrian oil, imposing travel and financial sanctions on Assad and those closest to him. There was also agreement to step up preparations to get humanitarian aid into cities like Homs. The group pledged to boost relief shipments and set up supply depots along Syria's borders, but it's unclear how it would be distributed without government approval. Confirming the appointment of the former UN Secretary-General Kofi Annan as the joint UN and Arab League Special Envoy for Syria, the current UN Chief Ban Ki-moon will begin planning for the deployment of Blue Helmet peacekeeping forces. Well, despite the show of unity to end the violence, there were signs of division. Some of the delegates, especially Gulf states, long opposed to Assad, pressed for an international peacekeeping force in Syria and favoured arming the Syrian rebels. The Friends of Syria group is set to meet again soon, first in Turkey and then in France. Al Jazeera's Lawrence Lee reports. After the Tunis conference, these fighters are now regarded as legitimate defenders of the Syrian people. And even though their political representatives may be a diverse group disinclined to agree with each other, they too are now recognized by the Friends of Syria grouping as a legitimate opposition to Bashar al-Assad. Not that that changes much in the short term, because there's a war to fight. The FSA is doing a good job. Everybody has the right to express themselves. They have to speak in the name of God and in respect of the revolution. That's equal for the authority. They have to put God into their hearts and work for the people. There had been warnings before the Tunis conference that there was a limit to what it was likely to achieve, but all the same, many protesters must be as disappointed as the leader of the Syrian National Council. Privately, no doubt, diplomats must wish the SNC would act in a more cohesive way, but it is genuinely difficult to know what the opposition can hope for further than more sanctions against the president and his government. We are not asking the world to undertake the revolution on our behalf, be it peacefully or militarily. This is our right and our duty, and we in Syria fight our own battles. What we are asking of them is that they support us. The news that Hamas has now turned its back on the Assad government may confuse things still further. The Palestinian group, described as terrorists in much of the world, has for years viewed President al-Assad as an ally against Israel. It's nothing short of extraordinary that Hamas now finds itself on the same side as many Western countries in their criticism of the Assad government. The opposition must have a minimum level of coordination in order to benefit from international support, and the international community will have to find a minimum level of coordination to actually have some kind of impact, which they haven't yet. While all the players in this work out their positions, there remains the most urgent need for humanitarian assistance in Homs in particular, where the trapped and injured Western journalists apparently refused Red Cross help in order to allow women and children to get out first. Syrian State TV, which mirrors the world of its presidents, described the Tunis conference not as friends of Syria, but as friends of America. 
They aired most of it live and saw it as a neo-imperialist attempt to divide the country and a disorganized one. Lawrence Lee for Inside Syria. So what did the conference actually achieve? To help us answer that question, let's bring in today's guests. In Tunis, Bassam Imadi, former Syrian ambassador to Sweden and a member of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Syrian National Council. In Washington, D.C., Walid Malouf, who served as an alternate representative of the U.S. to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And in London, Amar Wakaf, who's a member of the Syrian Social Club. That's a group that supports change in Syria under the supervision of the government. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, Bassam Imadi, we'll start with you. Was the Friends of Syria meeting in Tunis uh, anything other than uh, an expensive talking shop, a complete waste of time? Uh, well, actually, uh, you could say that, but uh, from our point of view as diplomats or politicians, we understand the mechanism of trying to assist the Syrian people. But on the other hand, the people on the ground would not like what happened at all. They wanted something tangible, action, to stop the killing and the massacres that are being uh, uh, done by the, uh, by the regime itself. I mean, uh, people are dying every day, massacres are taking place, shelling is of, of innocent people, civilians. What would such a conference do if, you, if it doesn't uh, produce uh, resolutions or decisions that have teeth, that have some power to stop the killing? Walid uh, uh, Malouf, um, is consensus-driven diplomacy the correct way to deal with what's happening on the ground right now in Syria? Well, unfortunately, sometimes consensus uh, work and sometimes it doesn't work. Unfortunately, in the Syrian situation, the consensus did not work at the UN a few weeks back and the Russians and uh, the Chinese did a double veto for a more effective uh, solution for the killing uh, that the uh, Assad regime is undertaken. Uh, I am very disappointed from uh, the meeting in Tunis uh, because I thought at least the, uh, uh, the people who met there or the friend of Syria who met there uh, should at least uh, give the Assad a very strong warning that Homs is the Benghazi of Syria. He is not allowed to uh, run his tanks into the city and uh, uh, keep uh, responding uh, to this uprising with with bullets and with uh, can, you know with with with, uh, with tanks hitting uh, civil uh, areas uh, so i'm pretty disappointed from this friend of syria i think the friend of uh, the assad regimes are more effective uh, russia uh, hezbollah uh, the Iranians are uh, providing him with all means to maintain his, uh, his uh, attack on his civilian uh, society. And also, the Assad the regimes are great in uh, urban warfare. They had a 30-some experience, 30 years of experience in Lebanon. They, uh, they know very well how to shell civil areas like they shelled Beirut and Ashrafiyya and Zahli and all these towns. So uh, we, are, we are two peoples in two different countries, but we've been abused uh, by the same dictator. Okay. Okay. And uh, it is time for the Assad uh, family to le really leave Syria and leave it very quickly. Okay, Amar Wakaf, I, I know you want to come back on, on what you've, you've just heard uh, there, but also Syrian television depicted uh, the conference in, in Tunis, not as the, the friends of Syria, but uh, as the friends of the US. I mean, they have a point, don't they, in that uh, neither Russia nor China was there. Well, it's not about the, the, the types of the, or the names of the countries that attended, but it's about the approach of the uh, conference itself. Um, as a Syrian citizen, uh, and I've said this before on Al Jazeera, I would uh, actually expect the international community to intervene in a proactive way to A, reduce and ultimately halt the killing in Syria rather than increase it, and B, to ensure the uh, long-term prosperity and welfare of the Syrian people. And I think that the, uh, the way the international community is now going about the Syrian uh, issue is mainly focused on the toppling of the regime, and that is viewed by many Syrians as uh, immediately contradicting these two principles. So it is uh, considered by some of the Syrian population and probably the, the Syrian regime as well uh, as being uh, not friendly at all to Syria, but friendly to some other nation, perhaps the US.
Bassam Emadi, Russia has warned uh, Western and, and Arab nations uh, not to officially legitimize uh, the Syrian opposition. Uh, as as a, a diplomat, help us understand Moscow's uh, position. Is it that, that Moscow feels that, that support for the opposition only serves to undermine the prospect of any political, any negotiated settlement in Syria? In fact, the Russians uh, are, are acting outside the norm of the uh, international community. We saw in the United Nations General Assembly just a few weeks ago how 137 countries have come in support of the Arab initiative uh, for solution in Syria, condemning the Syrian regime, whereas Russia and China used veto, uh, their veto powers in order to block the same kind of support of the same uh, Arab initiative, which means that they are looking at the crisis in their own eyes, at, in their own interests. Uh, what is going to happen very soon, and this is why I said that this conference was a step in the right direction, maybe it's too little too late, but still we depend on that for the future, because we see this, uh, this uh, conference as a step to, to take better steps in the future, more steps, more practical steps in the future. At least the one thing that has been now achieved in this conference, that uh, more than 70 countries uh, and, and uh, a lot of uh, non-governmental non organizations have recognized the right of the Syrian people to resist this regime and also legitimized any assistance that would be given to the Syrian opposition on also the uh, Syrian uh, rebels on the ground to be able to defend themselves. Now, we are not talking about arming re the revolutionaries to fight the regime. We are talking about something else here. We are talking about the right for self-defense, which, which is very leg legitimate. Everybody in the world would support that. And this conference has given the go ahead in this thing. And now I would expect people who know what's going on in Syria, like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar, like other countries, uh, to start aiding the Syrian people to defend themselves by means of some weapons to stand against or, this machine of killing that is being used by the regime. All right. On, on that note, uh, Walid uh, Malouf, uh, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, uh, Saad al-Faisal, when asked about the possibility of, uh, of arming Syria's opposition, said that um, he thought it an excellent idea. Uh, what do you make of that? And, and do you think it's possible that, that Saudi Arabia and uh, perhaps Qatar are already arming the Syrian opposition? Well, I don't know if they are arming them or not, but as, uh, as the regime is pounding uh, Hamas and Hama and the other cities with bullets uh, and with cannons, uh, I mean, there, there must be a, a, a leveling the field in uh, protecting the uh, civil societies and the civilians in those, uh, in those towns. Uh, I think the military option should be on the table. How can you stop tanks from invading Homs? I mean, uh, you know, if you talk to military experts, uh, they will tell you the only way is by, uh, by flying airplanes and hitting those targets. So I don't know when the international community is going to stop this attack on uh, the uh, civilians in, um, uh, in Homs. And uh, Homs should be a red line for the Assad regime. He should be forbidden from entering Homs militarily uh, because it's going to create an uproar around the world. And I agree with Ambassador Ahmadi that this uh, meeting in Tunis somehow is a, a good step forward. But it came too short uh, to really uh, stop these kind of killings. Uh, uh, who in the world, we are in the 21st century, who in the world will accept to see on TV on daily basis uh, children, women, and uh, young men being killed by a uh, regime? All right. I, I mean, it is, it is unacceptable. Um, Amar, it, is, Amar, it is our duty. Amar Wakaf, in, 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 in London, please, I mean, re respond to what you've, you've just heard there and uh, uh, to, the, to those allegations that, that nations like Saudi, and Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar are perhaps already arming uh, the Syrian opposition. 
Well, everyone knows that the Syrian opposition is being armed specifically by, by, by those two countries and other countries as well. You have training in, in Turkey, for example. Uh, but I think we, we should be rational about this rather than emotional, you know. Uh, let's, let's, regard, uh, let's, let's have a look really at what is happening. There are a lot of demonstrations that are taking place in Syria in so many places. And they are peaceful and you cannot see army over there. Why? Because there are no armed people. Uh, you, you see the army in Homs because there are armed people in Homs uh, who are uh, taking hostage part of the uh, part of the population. The government has the duty to go in and has the obligation um, to, to go in and free those people from uh, uh, the armed groups who perhaps would not allow them to go onto the streets to open their shops and so on and so forth. The government has the obligation to restore law and order in a place like Homs or city uh, or Hama or Dara or whatever it is. Uh, peaceful demonstrations that go in Al Qamishli, in, uh, in other places, in Qara. You have lots of places where you have peaceful demonstrations going and you cannot see an army. Uh, uh, infantrymen rather than a tank, let alone a tank in, uh, in those places. So Bassam, we need to uh, calm uh, down here. Okay, uh, Bassam Imadi, I, I know you're itching to, to get yes. in here, please. <laughs> yes, you are right. Well, it seems that your guest, uh, respectable guest, uh, Mr. Malouf in, in London, I think he and his regime are living in an, on another planet. He's talking about demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations. Now we know very well, just one week ago in Mazza, there was a very peaceful demonstration. They were actually just, uh, it was a funeral. And then the army or the thugs and the security people started shooting at, at those who were just walking behind the coffin. Is, what, does he call that uh, armed gangs? I mean, we are, we are fed up with this story. Please stop it. Okay, okay. Don't, don't uh, in, insult our intelligence. Now, one more thing, please. Now, he's talking about uh, training and uh, providing arms to, uh, to the revolutionaries. Who is doing that? Nobody is, 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 is providing any weapon. Nobody is providing any training. We wish that would happen. Actually, it's not. People inside are buying with their own money, smuggling p small pieces of arms. Uh, we wish that the international community, community would start to do that. And by the way, I said that we are to some extent ex uh, satisfied with this conference only because we know the reality that the international community is not willing to intervene. And that's right. why we say that this conference is a step in the okay. right direction. All right. It's, it's Amar Wakaf who's, who's in London. Uh, uh, yeah. Amar, do you, do you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, th thanks for the ex-ambassador to bring in the, the Mazze example. I think that is a clear and classic example of a peaceful demonstration being hijacked by uh, a few people who had some arms and, uh, you know, they, they, they completely take the demonstration into a completely different level and require some action by the police forces and the law, law and order forces. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we all know that those people are not buying weapons from their own money. They're being funded, they're being, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, some facilitation of smuggling of arms from Lebanon, from Turkey, from Iraq even. Uh, we have uh, Al-Qaeda now operating uh, in, uh, in Syria on a considerable scale, really. And, uh, y you know, you cannot say that the government is going to sit and watch for the country to disintegrate into a lawless and orderless uh, place on the planet. They have the obligation and duty to restore law and order. Now, with regards to uh, what the government uh, has in mind, there is an initiative, a political initiative, that uh, is taking place at the moment. Tomorrow there is going to be a referendum on a new constitution that for the first time in about 50 years would allow multi-party elections. Now, for example, if the SNC would want to go into this election, Every Syrian knows that the SNC is not a coherent group, but it's mainly made of a core of uh, Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists. And you have these shiny figures on the outside and peripherals who, in order to give the impression that this is uh, really a, 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 a sort of a comprehensive group. But it isn't. If that particular political uh, figure is going to go into the elections according to the new constitution, they will immediately break into smaller parties. Okay. And that tells you that if the Syrian people do not recognize this uh, Syrian National Council, I don't think it was quite wise from some uh, international uh, uh, members to, uh, of, the, of the UN to, to uh, uh, acknowledge okay. it themselves. Right. It's, we'll, we'll come, uh, it's we'll come back to the referendum. The people. We'll come back to the referendum again in, in, in just a moment. But first, I want yeah. to bring in once again uh, Walid Malouf in, in Washington, D.C. Um, well, Secretary, I want to tell hey, Ammar. Uh, just a minute. Yes. Yeah, carry on. I, carry on. I want to tell Ammar, smuggling 
weapons from Lebanon. There is a UN Security, Con uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1680 demanding the, uh, uh, the, the Syrian government and the Lebanese government to demark the, 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 the borders between Lebanon and uh, Syria. And uh, your, the government that you are defending, Ya Amr, has not done anything about it. So to come with this accusation that uh, smuggling weapons from Lebanon is really, uh, in my opinion, uh, ridiculous. And you need to know, Amr, Ammar or Amr, that you, a position you're taking like this, the Syrian people are going to hold you responsible for defending a regime and you are minimizing the danger and the military attack that this government you are defending against your own people. And plus, if there well, is any smuggle of weapons, it is between your wonderful government that is killing its people and Hezbollah, its ally, and Iran. So please don't drag Lebanon into any of these uh, uh, fights that is going on between you people. Uh, Lebanon is not responsible for any smuggle of weapons. Okay. Lebanon is, uh, is a country that has been attacked by the Assad regime for 30 years. They destroyed its economy. They destroyed its character. They destroyed it is, uh, its standing in the okay. world. And you uh, are standing now and defending this regime and accusing right. Lebanon of smuggling Waleed. weapons into Syria. It is, okay. it is ridiculous. Uh, Waleed, we're, we're I, rapidly running out of time I, here. Let, I, let's get a response from, uh, from yeah. Amar. Yeah, I think I'm not defending the regime. I'm only representing a large segment of the Syrian people, mind you. And I did not drag Lebanon into this uh, uh, conversation. I was not the person who invited you to this program. And mind you as well, there are a lot of Lebanese who feel proud oh, of the Syrian support that, that has been going on for uh, about, what, 30, smuggling, 40 years? Smuggling uh, weapons you know, the people into of the Syria. Resistance. This is not acceptable from you to say that. It's totally but not this is acceptable. what is happening. You cannot deny it. Why, why are you denying this? This is happening. Everybody knows that, you know, through Tal Kalakh. Your uh, ally Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon is, is working with you, so don't drag the Lebanese. Hezbollah is a totally why, independent why are you? state, and you're dealing with it. Well, I, I think you should be dealing with Hezbollah yourselves. Don't drag us into this, please. All right. There is a lot of, you know, smuggling of not only weapons, but also fighters, foreign okay. fighters coming from both Lebanon and Turkey. All right. We uh, all know let, that. Let, why, let, why should let, we let's deny move, it? Let's move on. Uh, Bassam uh, Emadi, what are we to make of the fact that, uh, that uh, President Bashar al-Assad is, is pressing ahead with his uh, plan to hold the referendum uh, on Sunday uh, for uh, a new constitution for Syria? Uh, we believe that this is a new farce that he is uh, uh, staging now because uh, he is just trying to um, convince the world that he is uh, carrying out some reforms in Syria. Everybody knows that this uh, constitution, even if it is okay accepted, it will not be uh, a constitution that is going to govern the actions of, of the, the government and the regime because we have this experience before. But let me say something for your uh, uh, respectable guest in, in, in London. Uh, the Syrian people went demonstration, demonstrating very peacefully for over 10 months. And they were killed by this regime, by the thugs of this regime, Shabiha, as you know, security forces. They were not holding any arms. But then when they found out that the international community is not going to save them from this monstrous regime, they started defending their homes because those thugs and, and security forces were coming in, stealing their uh, uh, juries, okay. uh, killing them, uh, okay. raping their women. So they started right. holding arms. Now, okay. when, now, uh, when he says, let me, this is an important point, let me please, because he has We're, we're very too tight much on time. time. We're very tight on time, Bassam. All right, but I'm going, I have to say this. When he talks about smuggling arms from Lebanon, we can imagine, even if there is smuggling, if we take that for granted, how much is being smuggled? Does it compare okay. with the sh ships that are coming from Iran and from, the, from Russia, which are arming the regime up to its teeth? Killing, allowing it to kill, to kill its own people. This is the question which Amar, I want, all right, Mr. Uh, Malouf, to. Amar, uh, you've got about 20 Waqaf. seconds. 20 seconds to answer, Amar. 
Yeah, well, uh, probably His Ex Excellency didn't uh, know or hear about the attack on the army on Banyas, the attack on the army officers' buildings in Saida, attack on the uh, security forces in Nawa, the Zajistri Shughur, and all these all right. things. Okay. He's probably saw that all as peaceful. The Syrians know better. Gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much indeed to uh, all our guests uh, in Tunis, Bassam Imadi in Washington, D.C., Walid Malouf, and in London, Amar Wakaf. Thank you very much indeed for watching. If you want to catch the show again online, just go to our website, aljazeera.com. Join us again next week for more Inside Syria. From me, Adrian Finnegan, bye for now.